Bernard Lewis, FBA, the 31st of May 1916 to the 19th of May 2018, was a British American historian specializing in oriental studies. He was also known as a public intellectual and political commentator. Lewis was the Cleveland E. Dodge Professor Emeritus of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. Lewis' expertise was in the history of Islam and the interaction between Islam and the West. He was also noted in academic circles for his works on the history of the Ottoman Empire. Lewis served as a soldier in the British Army in the Royal Armoured Corps and Intelligence Corps during the Second World War before being seconded to the Foreign Office. After the war, he returned to the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London and was appointed to the new chair in Near and Middle Eastern History. In 2007 and 1999, respectively, Lewis was called the West's leading interpreter of the Middle East and the most influential post-war historian of Islam and the Middle East. His advice was frequently sought by neoconservative policymakers, including the Bush administration. However, his support of the Iraq War and neoconservative ideals have since come under scrutiny. Lewis was also notable for his public debates with Edward Said, who accused Lewis and other Orientalists of misrepresenting Islam and serving the purposes of imperialist domination, to which Lewis responded by defending Orientalism as a facet of humanism and accusing Said of politicizing the subject. Lewis argued that the deaths of the Armenian Genocide resulted from a struggle between two nationalistic movements and that there is no proof of intent by the Ottoman government to exterminate the Armenian nation. These views prompted a number of scholars to accuse Lewis of genocide denial and resulted in a successful civil lawsuit against him in a French court. Topic. Family and personal life Bernard Lewis was born to middle-class Jewish parents, Harry Lewis and the former Jane Levy, in Stoke Newington, London. He became interested in languages and history while preparing for his bar mitzvah. Lewis became a naturalized citizen of the United States in 1982. In 1947 he married Ruth Ellen Oppenheim, with whom he had a daughter and a son. Their marriage was dissolved in 1974. Academic career In 1936, Lewis graduated from the School of Oriental Studies now School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS at the University of London with a BA in History with special reference to the Near and Middle East. He earned his PhD three years later, also from SOAS, specialising in the history of Islam. Lewis also studied law, going part of the way toward becoming a solicitor, but returned to study Middle Eastern history. He undertook postgraduate studies at the University of Paris, where he studied with the Orientalist Louis Massignon and earned the Diplôme des études sémitiques in 1937. He returned to SOAS in 1938 as an assistant lecturer in Islamic history. During the Second World War, Lewis served in the British Army in the Royal Armoured Corps and as a corporal in the Intelligence Corps in 1940 41 before being seconded to the Foreign Office. After the war, he returned to SOAS. In 1949, at the age of 33, he was appointed to the new chair in Near and Middle Eastern History. In 1974, aged 57, Lewis accepted a joint position at Princeton University and the Institute for Advanced Study, also located in Princeton, New Jersey. The terms of his appointment were such that Lewis taught only one semester per year, and being free from administrative responsibilities, he could devote more time to research than previously. Consequently, Lewis' arrival at Princeton marked the beginning of the most prolific period in his research career during which he published numerous books and articles based on previously accumulated materials. After retiring from Princeton in 1986, Lewis served at Cornell University until 1990. In 1966, Lewis was a founding member of the Learn Society, Middle East Studies Association of North America Mesa, but in 2007 he broke away and founded Association for the Study of the Middle East and Africa ASMEA to challenge Mesa, which the New York Sun noted as dominated by academics who have been critical of Israel and of America's role in the Middle East." The organization was formed as an academic society dedicated to promoting high standards of research and teaching in Middle Eastern and African studies and other related fields, with Lewis as chairman of its academic council. In 1990, the National Endowment for the Humanities selected Lewis for the Jefferson Lecture, the U.S. federal government's highest honor for achievement in the humanities. 
His lecture, entitled, Western Civilization, A View from the East, was revised and reprinted in the Atlantic Monthly under the title, The Roots of Muslim Rage. His 2007 Irving Crystal Lecture, given to the American Enterprise Institute, was published as Europe and Islam. Research Lewis' influence extends beyond academia to the general public. He was a pioneer of the social and economic history of the Middle East and is famous for his extensive research of the Ottoman archives. He began his research career with the study of medieval Arab, especially Syrian, history. His first article, dedicated to professional guilds of medieval Islam, had been widely regarded as the most authoritative work on the subject for about 30 years. However, after the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, scholars of Jewish origin found it more and more difficult to conduct archival and field research in Arab countries, where they were suspected of espionage. Therefore, Lewis switched to the study of the Ottoman Empire, while continuing to research Arab history through the Ottoman archives which had only recently been opened to Western researchers. A series of articles that Lewis published over the next several years revolutionized the history of the Middle East by giving a broad picture of Islamic society, including its government, economy, and demographics. Lewis argued that the Middle East is currently backward and its decline was a largely self inflicted condition resulting from both culture and religion, as opposed to the post colonialist view which posits the problems of the region as economic and political maldevelopment mainly due to the 19th century European colonization. In his 1982 work Muslim Discovery of Europe, Lewis argues that Muslim societies could not keep pace with the West and that, "...crusader successes were due in no small part to Muslim weakness." Further, he suggested that as early as the 11th century Islamic societies were decaying, primarily the byproduct of internal problems like, "...cultural arrogance." which was a barrier to creative borrowing, rather than external pressures like the Crusades. In the wake of Soviet and Arab attempts to delegitimize Israel as a racist country, Lewis wrote a study of antisemitism, Semites and Anti-Semites In other works he argued Arab rage against Israel was disproportionate to other tragedies or injustices in the Muslim world, such as the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and control of Muslim-majority land in Central Asia. The bloody and destructive fighting during the Hama uprising in Syria 1982, the Algerian Civil War 1992-1998, and the Iran-Iraq War 1980-1988. In addition to his scholarly works, Lewis wrote several influential books accessible to the general public, The Arabs in History 1950, The Middle East and the West 1964, and The Middle East 1995. In the wake of the September 11, 2001 attacks, the interest in Lewis' work surged, especially his 1990 essay The Roots of Muslim Rage. Three of his books were published after 9-11, What Went Wrong?, written before the attacks, which explored the reasons of the Muslim world's apprehension of and sometimes outright hostility to modernization, the crisis of Islam, and Islam, the religion and the people. <laughs> <laughs> Armenian Genocide The first two editions of Lewis' The Emergence of Modern Turkey 1961 and 1968 describe the Armenian Genocide as "...the terrible holocaust of 1915, when a million and a half Armenians perished." In later editions, this text is altered to "...the terrible slaughter of 1915, when, according to estimates, more than a million Armenians perished, as well as an unknown number of Turks." In this passage, Lewis argues that the deaths were the result of a struggle for the same land between two competing nationalist movements. The change in Lewis' textual description of the Armenian Genocide and his signing of the petition against the Congressional Resolution was controversial among some Armenian historians as well as journalists, who suggested that Lewis was engaging in historical revisionism to serve his own political and personal interests. Lewis called the label, Genocide, the Armenian version of this history. In a November 1993 interview with Le Monde, for which he faced a civil proceeding in a French court. In a subsequent exchange on the pages of Le Monde, Lewis wrote that while terrible atrocities did occur, there exists no serious proof of a decision and of a plan of the Ottoman government aiming to exterminate the Armenian nation. In reference to both these articles, the court stated that Lewis 
failed in his duty of objectivity and prudence in expressing himself without nuance on such a sensitive subject." He was ordered to pay one franc as damages for his statements on the Armenian genocide in Ottoman Turkey. Three other court cases against Bernard Lewis failed in the Paris Tribunal, including one filed by the Armenian National Committee of France and two filed by Jacques Trimalit de Villers. Lewis' views on the Armenian Genocide were criticized by a number of historians and sociologists, among them Alain Finkielkraut, Yves Ternan, Richard G. Hovannesian, Robert Melson, and Pierre Vidal Naquet. Lewis has argued for his denial stance that, the meaning of genocide is the planned destruction of a religious and ethnic group, as far as it is known to me, there is no evidence for that in the case of the Armenians. There is no evidence of a decision to massacre. On the contrary, there is considerable evidence of attempts to prevent it, which were not very successful. Yes there were tremendous massacres, the numbers are very uncertain but a million may well be likely. And the issue is not whether the massacres happened or not, but rather if these massacres were as a result of a deliberate preconceived decision of the Turkish government. There is no evidence for such a decision. Lewis stated that he believed to make the Armenian genocide a parallel with the Holocaust in Germany was rather absurd. In an interview with Haaretz, he stated, the deniers of Holocaust have a purpose, to prolong Nazism and to return to Nazi legislation. Nobody wants the young Turks back, and nobody wants to have back the Ottoman law. What do the Armenians want? The Armenians want to benefit from both worlds. On the one hand, they speak with pride of their struggle against the Ottoman despotism, while on the other hand, they compare their tragedy to the Jewish Holocaust. I do not accept this. I do not say that the Armenians did not suffer terribly. But I find enough cause for me to contain their attempts to use the Armenian massacres to diminish the worth of the Jewish Holocaust and to relate to it instead as an ethnic dispute. Lewis has been labeled a genocide denier by Stephen Zunes, Israel Charna, David B. MacDonald and the Armenian National Committee of America. Yer Oren suggested that, Lewis' stature provided a lofty cover for the Turkish national agenda of obfuscating academic research on the Armenian genocide. Israel Charna wrote that Lewis, "...seemingly scholarly concern of Armenians constituting a threat to the Turks as a rebellious force who together with the Russians threatened the Ottoman Empire, and the insistence that only a policy of deportations was executed, barely conceal the fact that the organized deportations constituted systematic mass murder." Charna compares the "...logical structures." employed by Lewis in his denial of the genocide to those employed by Ernst Nolt in his Holocaust negationism, when Lewis received the National Humanities Medal from U.S. President George W. Bush in November 2006, the Armenian National Committee of America objected, "...the president's decision to honor the work of a known genocide denier." An academic mercenary whose politically motivated efforts to cover up the truth run counter to the very principles this award was established to honor represents a true betrayal of the public trust. Topic. Views and influence on contemporary politics In the mid-1960s, Lewis emerged as a commentator on the issues of the modern Middle East and his analysis of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the rise of militant Islam brought him publicity and aroused significant controversy. American historian Joel Baining has called him, "...perhaps the most articulate and learned Zionist advocate in the North American Middle East academic community." Lewis' policy advice has particular weight thanks to this scholarly authority. U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney remarked, "...in this new century, his wisdom is sought daily by policymakers, diplomats, fellow academics, and the news media." A harsh critic of the Soviet Union, Lewis continued the liberal tradition in Islamic historical studies. Although his early Marxist views had a bearing on his first book The Origins of Ismailism, Lewis subsequently discarded Marxism. His later works are a reaction against the left-wing current of third-worldism which came to be a significant current in Middle Eastern studies. During his career, Lewis developed ties with governments around the world. During her time as Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir assigned Lewis articles as reading to her cabinet members, and during the presidency of George W. Bush, he advised administration members including Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Bush himself. 
He was also close to King Hussein of Jordan and his brother, Prince Hassan bin Talal. He also had ties to the regime of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah of Iran, the Turkish military dictatorship led by Kenan Evren, and the Egyptian government of Anwar Sadat. He acted as a go between between the Sadat administration and Israel in 1971 when he relayed a message to the Israeli government regarding the possibility of a peace agreement at the request of Sadat's spokesman Tahasan Bashir. Lewis advocated closer Western ties with Israel and Turkey, which he saw as especially important in light of the extension of the Soviet influence in the Middle East. Modern Turkey holds a special place in Lewis' view of the region due to the country's efforts to become a part of the West. He was an honorary fellow of the Institute of Turkish Studies, an honor which is given on the basis of generally recognized scholarly distinction and long and devoted service to the field of Turkish studies. Lewis views Christendom and Islam as civilizations that have been in perpetual collision since the advent of Islam in the 7th century. In his essay The Roots of Muslim Rage 1990, he argued that the struggle between the West and Islam was gathering strength. According to one source, this essay and Lewis 1990 Jefferson lecture on which the article was based first introduced the term Islamic fundamentalism to North America. This essay has been credited with coining the phrase Clash of Civilizations, which received prominence in the eponymous book by Samuel Huntington. However, another source indicates that Lewis first used the phrase, Clash of Civilizations, at a 1957 meeting in Washington where it was recorded in the transcript. In 1998, Lewis read in a London based newspaper Al Quds al Arabi a declaration of war on the United States by Osama bin Laden. In his essay, A License to Kill, Lewis indicated he considered bin Laden's language as the ideology of jihad and warned that bin Laden would be a danger to the West. The essay was published after the Clinton administration and the U.S. intelligence community had begun its hunt for bin Laden in Sudan and then in Afghanistan. Topic. Jihad Lewis presented some of his conclusions about Islamic culture, Sharia law, jihad, and the modern-day phenomenon of terrorism in his text Islam, the Religion and the People. He writes of jihad as a distinct, religious obligation, but suggests that, it is a pity, that people engaging in terrorist activities are not more aware of their own religion. Muslim fighters are commanded not to kill women, children, or the aged unless they attack first, not to torture or otherwise ill-treat prisoners, to give fair warning of the opening of hostilities or their resumption after a truce, and to honor agreements. At no time did the classical jurists offer any approval or legitimacy to what we nowadays call terrorism. Nor indeed is there any evidence of the use of terrorism as it is practiced nowadays. In Lewis' view, the by now widespread terrorism practice of suicide bombing is a development of the 20th century, with no antecedents in Islamic history, and no justification in terms of Islamic theology, law, or tradition." He further comments that, "...the fanatical warrior offering his victims the choice of the Quran or the sword is not only untrue, it is impossible," and that, Generally speaking, Muslim tolerance of unbelievers was far better than anything available in Christendom, until the rise of secularism in the 17th century." This view has been criticized by Assad Abukhalil, who noted that, "...methodologically, Lewis insists that terrorism by individual Muslims should be considered Islamic terrorism, while terrorism by individual Jews or Christians is never considered Jewish or Christian terrorism." He also criticized Lewis' understanding of Osama bin Laden, seeing Lewis' interpretation of bin Laden as some kind of influential Muslim theologian, along the lines of classical theologians like al-Ghazali, rather than the terrorist fanatic that he is. Abu Khalil has also criticized the place of Islam in Lewis' worldview more generally, arguing that the most prominent feature of his work was its theologocentrism. Borrowing a term from Maxime Rodinson that Lewis interprets all aspects of behavior among Muslims solely through the lens of Islamic theology, subsuming the study of Muslim peoples, their languages, the geographical areas where Muslims predominate, Islamic governments, the governments of Arab countries and Sharia under the label of Islam. Topic. Debates with Edward Said 
Lewis was known for his literary debates with Edward Said, the Palestinian-American literary theorist whose aim was to deconstruct what he called Orientalist scholarship. Said, who was a professor at Columbia University, characterized Lewis' work as a prime example of Orientalism in his 1978 book Orientalism and in his later book covering Islam. Said asserted that the field of Orientalism was political intellectualism bent on self-affirmation rather than objective study, a form of racism, and a tool of imperialist domination. He further questioned the scientific neutrality of some leading Middle East scholars, including Lewis, on the Arab world. In an interview with Al Aram Weekly, Said suggested that Lewis' knowledge of the Middle East was so biased that it could not be taken seriously and claimed. Bernard Lewis hasn't set foot in the Middle East, in the Arab world, for at least 40 years. He knows something about Turkey, I'm told, but he knows nothing about the Arab world." Said considered that Lewis treats Islam as a monolithic entity without the nuance of its plurality, internal dynamics, and historical complexities, and accused him of "...demagogy and downright ignorance." In covering Islam, Said argued that Lewis simply cannot deal with the diversity of Muslim, much less human life, because it is closed to him as something foreign, radically different, and other." And he criticized Lewis' inability to grant that the Islamic peoples are entitled to their own cultural, political, and historical practices, free from Lewis' calculated attempt to show that because they are not Western, they can't be good. Rejecting the view that Western scholarship was biased against the Middle East, Lewis responded that Orientalism developed as a facet of European humanism, independently of the past European imperial expansion. He noted the French and English pursued the study of Islam in the 16th and 17th centuries, yet not in an organized way, but long before they had any control or hope of control in the Middle East, and that much of Orientalist study did nothing to advance the cause of imperialism. In his 1993 book Islam and the West, Lewis wrote, "...what imperial purpose was served by deciphering the ancient Egyptian language, for example, and then restoring to the Egyptians knowledge of and pride in their forgotten, ancient past?" Furthermore, Lewis accused Said of politicizing the scientific study of the Middle East and Arabic studies in particular, neglecting to critique the scholarly findings of the Orientalists, and giving "...free reign," to his biases. Topic. Stance on the Iraq War In 2002, Lewis wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal regarding the build-up to the Iraq War entitled, Time for Toppling, where he stated his opinion that, A regime change may well be dangerous, but sometimes the dangers of inaction are greater than those of action. In 2007, Jacob Weisberg described Lewis as, perhaps the most significant intellectual influence behind the invasion of Iraq." Michael Hirsch attributed to Lewis the view that regime change in Iraq would provide a jolt that would «modernize the Middle East» and suggested that Lewis allegedly «orientalist» theories about «what went wrong» in the Middle East, and other writings, formed the intellectual basis of the push towards war in Iraq. Hirsch reported that Lewis had told him in an interview that he viewed the September 11 attacks as the opening salvo of the final battle. Between Western and Islamic civilizations, Lewis believed that a forceful response was necessary. In the run up to the Iraq War, he met with Vice President Dick Cheney several times. Hirsch quoted an unnamed official who was present at a number of these meetings, who summarized Lewis' view of Iraq as, Get on with it. Don't dither. Brent Scowcroft quoted Lewis as stating that he believed, that one of the things you've got to do to Arabs is hit them between the eyes with a big stick. They respect power." Asad Abukhalil has claimed that Lewis assured Cheney that American troops would be welcomed by Iraqis and Arabs, relying on the opinion of his colleague Fouad Ajami. Hirsch also drew parallels between the Bush administration's plans for post invasion Iraq and Lewis' views, in particular his admiration for Mustafa Kemal Ataturk's secularist and westernizing reforms in the new Republic of Turkey, which emerged from the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Writing in 2008, Lewis did not advocate imposing freedom and democracy on Islamic nations. There are things you can't impose. Freedom, for example, or democracy. Democracy is a very strong medicine which has to be administered to the patient in small, gradually increasing doses. Otherwise, you risk killing the patient. In the main, the Muslims have to do it themselves. 
Ian Baruma, writing for The New Yorker in an article subtitled, The Two Minds of Bernard Lewis, finds Lewis' stance on the war difficult to reconcile with Lewis' past statements cautioning democracy enforcement in the world at large. Baruma ultimately rejects suggestions by his peers that Lewis promotes war with Iraq to safeguard Israel, but instead concludes, Perhaps he loves it the Arab world too much. It is a common phenomenon among Western students of the Orient to fall in love with a civilization. Such love often ends in bitter impatience when reality fails to conform to the ideal. The rage, in this instance, is that of the Western scholar. His beloved civilization is sick. And what would be more heartwarming to an old Orientalist than to see the greatest Western democracy cure the benighted Muslim? It is either that or something less charitable, if a final showdown between the great religions is indeed the inevitable result of a millennial clash, then we had better make sure that we win. Hamid Dabashi, writing on 28 May 2018, in an article subtitled, On Bernard Lewis and His Extraordinary Capacity for Getting Everything Wrong, asked, Just imagine, what sort of a person would spend a lifetime studying people he loathes? It is quite a bizarre proposition. But there you have it, the late Bernard Lewis did precisely that." Similarly, Richard Bouliot described Lewis as a person who does not like the people he is purporting to have expertise about less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 he doesn't respect them, he considers them to be good and worthy only to the degree they follow a western path. According to Asad Abukhalil, Lewis has poisoned the Middle East academic field more than any other Orientalist and his influence has been both academic and political. But there is a new generation of Middle East experts in the West who now see clearly the political agenda of Bernard Lewis. It was fully exposed in the Bush years. Topic. Alleged nuclear threat from Iran In 2006, Lewis wrote that Iran had been working on a nuclear weapon for 15 years. In August 2006, in an article about whether the world can rely on the concept of mutual assured destruction as a deterrent in its dealings with Iran, Lewis wrote in the Wall Street Journal about the significance of the 22nd of August 2006 in the Islamic calendar. The Iranian president had indicated he would respond by that date to U.S. demands regarding Iran's development of nuclear power. Lewis wrote that the date corresponded to the 27th day of the month of Rajab of the year 1427, the day Muslims commemorate the night flight of Muhammad from Jerusalem to heaven and back. Lewis wrote that it would be an appropriate date for the apocalyptic ending of Israel and, if necessary, of the world. According to Lewis, mutual assured destruction is not an effective deterrent in the case of Iran, because of what Lewis describes as the Iranian leadership's apocalyptic worldview and the suicide or martyrdom complex that plagues parts of the Islamic world today." He then suggested the possibility of a nuclear strike on Israel on of August 2006. What is the significance of August 22? This year, August 22 corresponds, in the Islamic calendar, to the 27th day of the month of Rajab of the year 1427. This, by tradition, is the night when many Muslims commemorate the night flight of Muhammad on the winged horse Barak, first to the farthest mosque, usually identified with Jerusalem, and then to heaven and back Quran 17 This might well be deemed an appropriate date for the apocalyptic ending of Israel and if necessary of the world. It is far from certain that Mr. Ahmadinejad plans any such cataclysmic events precisely for the 22nd of August but it would be wise to bear the possibility in mind. Lewis' article received significant press coverage. However, the day passed without any incident. In his 2009 book Engaging the Muslim World, the American academic Juan Cole responded that there was no evidence to suggest that Iran had been working on a nuclear weapon for 15 years. He also disagreed with Lewis' suggestion that Ahmadinejad might deploy this weapon against Israel on the 22nd of August 2006. Topic. Death Bernard Lewis died on 19 May 2018 at the age of 101, at an assisted living care facility in Voorhees Township, New Jersey, 12 days before his 102nd birthday. Topic. See also 
Bernard Lewis bibliography List of Princeton University people References Bibliography External links Bernard Lewis on IMDb Works by Bernard Lewis at Open Library Lewis Page at Princeton University Revered and Reviled – Lewis Profile on Moment Magazine The Legacy and Fallacies of Bernard Lewis by as Ad Abukhalil Appearances on C-SPAN <laughs>